สมเจอยังก็จบองจนุยมเรประกาศบรรทอกจำนาการในเตวิธีสำนาการยืนสัพพิญญาอันตรจิตดำเนินบรรทอกในสเตทไลกาในสเตทสันธานบรรจบกิจวิพิษาดิ้งดอลสัปดาห์นี้สมองคุณลูกประธานยมบ้านบรรจุในสัปดาห์นี้สมองคุณลูกประธานยมบ้านบรรจุในสัปดาห์นี้สมองคุณลูกประธานยมบ้านบรรจุในสัปดาห์นี้สมองคุณลูกประธานยมบ้านบรรจุในสัปดาห์นี้สมองคุณลูกประธานยมบ้านบรรจุในสัปดาห์นี้สมองคุณลูกประธานยมบ้านบรรจุในสัปดาห์นี้สมองคุณลูกประธานยมบ้านบรรจุในสัปดาห์นี้สมองคุณลูกประธานยมบ้านบรรจุในสัปดาห์นี้สมองคุณลูกประธานยม Francois Bizot's opinion of his beliefs. This belief in the CPK, Your Honour, has continued after M13 throughout S21 and well beyond. I mentioned earlier his close relationship with Sun Sen. Let's recall this man was the accused direct supervisor and a direct participant. At the highest level, in crimes taking place throughout this country. In the last days of the trial, when asked about him, the accused responded, "It is the moment I really am waiting." To reveal the truth to the world and Cambodia, I was very shocked when enemies implicated him. I was very worried for him. After the 25th of June, 1986, I still had very great respect and thankfulness to him. Sun Sen testified in court. Together with other senior leaders in the CPK, was the embodiment of the criminal policies of the revolution. He initiated the establishment of S21 and supervised its operation. According to the accused, this is the man that threatened him with his life if he did not perform his duties diligently. The man that gave him no choice and no opportunity to escape from the horrors of M13 and S21. And yet years after the collapse of the regime, the accused holds him in the highest regard and fears for his safety. What logic, what logic allows us to accept that you could have great respectfulness and faithfulness to a man that forced you to commit such horrendous crimes under the threat of death. A man who forced you to bring so much pain agony and tragedy to so many people. Of course, there was no such reluctance and no such threats. The accused and Sun Sen were brothers in arms. In a misguided and idealistic crusade, in which they were prepared to sell their souls, their hearts and their humanity. Your Honours, as much as the accused has talked at length in this trial and offered, often evaded to answer the question directly, the length of the trial has been beneficial at times, as it's allowed him to talk freely and it's allowed the truth to slip out from under the lie that he was an unwilling, unwilling and fearful executioner at S21. For example, when testifying about his attendance at a two-week Communist Party of Kampuchea conference political education session in late 1978, he explained how he felt when he met Polk. This is what transpired. Question. You mentioned earlier that some party members would be jealous if other party members met Polk. 
สมาชิกปักเงินส่วนแรกเราสั้นบานปักจนบานหมกบานชั่วปุ่นปุ่นตาลบิจารณาจะบุกสันบานลบหรือก็ยังไม่เราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนินวัดเงินบอกเราไปดำเนิน For three years, now I meet the first person in the party for the first time, and I had a very strange feeling. But it's hard to describe the feeling at the time. Question: Did it make you feel good to be in his presence? Answer: The strange feeling, you know, the good feeling. The good feeling. Your Honours, this good feeling is about hot. If anyone deserved the resentment of the accused for making him commit crimes against his will, as he claims, it was hot. Brother number one, the leader of the CPK movement, who with others devised the plan of which the crimes of S21 formed an integral part. Yet the accused felt proud to have been able to meet Pol Pot, just as he felt devoted and had great respect for Sun Sen. This honest expression gives us a great insight into the beliefs that gave him the will and the ability to commit horrible acts. Allow me to remind you that this meeting occurred in the last half of 1978, at the same time when the accused wants you to believe that he was completely disillusioned with the CPK policies. His latest statement at the end of the trial that he was happy to be with Pol Pot because he said Pol Pot said there would be fewer killings at S21 was clearly a calculated attempt to change an earlier statement which he realised was particularly damaging to him. His admiration for the party could all but also be seen in the pride he gained from representing S21 as the chief ideologue. Again, in the long responses he has given in this case, small windows are found which we can connect and bigger truth. When he re reflected on the photograph of him at S21, the accused in uniform behind a microphone educating his staff in CPK policies, he remarked, if you look now to the picture, it seems like I was rather proud at the time for maintaining the class stand firmly. He further testified, I was the only one allowed to take the mic. The only one at S21 that had the authority to educate his staff in the CPK ideology. It was clear the accused was proud to receive instructions and proud to pass them on. He has told your honours he was proud when Sun Sen accepted his pro proposal to move S21 to the Lai Chi Ponyat compound. It could be seen to be proud of his work at S21 and S24 during 1978, again at a time when he says he was most disillusioned at the party. He testified how he wanted to promote the reputations of Kraysar and S21 within the CPK hierarchy by providing excess rice and Kraysar to the party centre. At the same time, his S21 and S24 prisoners were dying of starvation. He said, How could someone be so proud of his superiors? How could someone be so proud about helping create and running an extermination centre? How could someone be so proud as to indoctrinate his staff to torture and kill? How could someone be so proud in the rep reputation of such an evil place? It was because he believed in the past, believed in its ideals, and was in fact so content in his work 
quạt pin chất là lừa càng nhiều rồi bọc quạt đại bắc của chưa là lừa quạt phong đài this belief in the CPK ideology is clearly evident in the decisions he made in his personal life at the relevant times. Decisions which illustrate his confidence and investment in the revolution. After completing his assignment in, in M13, in the middle of 1975, he was fully aware that his next task would require him to further torture and kill the deceived enemies of the CPK. He was a young man and single. He married the woman of his choice at the end of 1975, clearly not phased by the prospect of his future assignment. By the time he was married, he had already taken part in the torture and killing of the first group of prisoners who had been taken from Takmau to S21's temporary location in Phnom Penh. The rapidly rising death toll at S21 did not deter the accused from starting a family. In 1976, his wife gave birth to his first child, and in 1978, his second, he fathered two children while children were being arrested and killed with their parents at S21. Further, he testified that he did not simply want to raise children, but wanted them to join the CPK revolution. In his words, he wanted them to, and I quote, love the revolution and to join the revolution. What a horrid disconnect to humanity surrounding him. While he was feeding and nurturing his own children, he was starving and ordering the brutal slaughter of others. And of course, Your Honours, it's a complete contradiction that on the one hand, he accused us as court to believe that he hated what the CPK stood for and yet wanted to have a family and raise his children to believe in its very policies. Your Honours, the accused accused absolute and genuine commitment to the CPK during his time at S21 has been further confirmed by the expert witnesses in this case. In their joint report, Dr. Ka Sunbanat and Dr. Francois Saroni Gilbert were the expert opinion that the accused was a committed CPK revolutionary during his time at S21. When discussing the issues of why the accused followed the orders to torture and kill, I quote their reports, the motivation for his acts were not the need to obey orders. Obeying orders was a consequence of his acts. The consequence of the need for something to believe in. Although at one point they accepted fear was a relevant factor to be taken into account, they held the belief that in the CPK, they held the, the accused belief in the CPK not fear was his prime motivator. They concluded that the accused saw himself as the protector of the party center and that his role gave him meaning. Moreover, the accused indicated to the experts that he still maintained his belief in the CPK ideals well after S21. When the experts asked him about the death of his father in 1990, he responded that he refused to have emotions because he could not be a, and I quote, revolutionary and have feelings. As to the reliability of this opinion, we ask your honours to take into account that these two experts spent a total of 30 hours with the accused.
This was an environment that was private, far more intimate than this court room, and for that matter, more intimate than when he was questioned by the investigative judges. It's our observation that in this trial, the more the accused speaks, the more likely he appears to reveal the truth, often unwittingly. But this fact, combined with the length of time and the nature of the location in which the experts interviewed the accused, enabled them to make some reliable findings which are otherwise unavailable to this court. The court has also heard expert testimony from David Chandler, Professor Chandler, one of the most foremost scholars on the inner workings of S21 CPK. He reviewed hundreds of his confessions containing the accused's annotations. It was his firm opinion that the accused believed in the purpose of the work at S21 as opposed to hating it. When asked by the defence whether the enthusiasm for his work at S21 was to be expected as it was part of the party line, Professor Chandler responded, and I quote, It wasn't just that it was part of the party line, it was a part of the party line that the defendant had absolutely no trouble accepting. It suited his own inclinations and his own ability and he was a revolutionary party person. Professor Chandler further gave a compelling account of the professionalism with which the accused performed his work, as well as his zeal, enthusiasm and initiative. He told your honours that the accused wanted S21 to be seen by his superiors and by the international community as a highly professional and efficient organisation of which he, as its administrator, could be justly proud. We ask that your honours place significant weight on Professor Chandler's testimony based on his unmatched research and the documentation discovered in S21. Professor Chandler has been in a unique position to provide this court with a highly reliable analysis of S21's operation, including how it implemented CPK policies and how the accused participated in that process. Finally, Your Honours, in the last day of questioning, the accused appeared to admit that whilst at S21, he did believe in CPK policies. When asked by the defence, do you admit that in reality you were the man who, enjoying the trust of your superiors, implemented in a devoted and merciless fashion, the persecution by the CPK of the Cambodia people in S21. Do you admit this, yes or no? To which the accused answered, yes, I completely admit it. Your Honours, if his words mean anything, finally it appears the accused decided to admit the truth. If the accused now says that he implemented the criminal policies of the CPK by willingly and not reluctantly carrying them out, if he means that he believes in the smashing policy as a means to a legitimate end, then this is a change. Your Honours, in fact, it's a complete turnaround to what he has pleaded during the judicial investigation and trial. As Your Honours are well aware, he has repeatedly told this court he hated his work, he lived in fear, he was forced to order torture and killing, with no choice or no chance of escape. If this is what he means by the word devotion, then the word has lost all of its definition. If, however, he did on the last day change his plea to his motive and intent in committing the crimes, then this is finally welcome. Though, Your Honours, it's very, very, very late. 
to anguish the civil parties will have suffered by sitting through the lies cannot be undone, but at least the accused will have set the record straight. Unfortunately, Your Honours, unless the accused tells us he has changed his plea or his motive in his closing statement, and we invite him to do so for the sake of the victims, we will never know what he really meant. As it stands, this ambiguous leading question, with its short answer, has left this court and the public with little chance to determine what he meant, regardless of the doubt as to whether or not the accused fully accepts his role at S21. The evidence of that role is not doubtful, ambiguous or unclear. The testimony and documents you have heard and read clearly prove that he was a willing participant committing the crimes not because he was ordered to, but because he believed in their legitimacy. To conclude, the accused was a perfectionist and a workaholic who remained thoroughly aware of everyone, everything going on around him through a system of strict discipline and constant reporting. He was extremely efficient in carrying out the crimes. We do not suggest that the accused is a monster, nor do we say that he is pathologically inhumane. However, we reject any suggestion that he was a prisoner of the regime and a less than willing participant in the crimes. Based on the evidence, this claim is completely unfounded. Your Honours, I now wish to turn to the, to the legal qualification the prosecution believe you should apply to the evidence that's being proved. Your Honours, this indictment charges the accused in accordance no. 